Okay, so um, maybe some of you disagree here, but I think Haskell is you know, a very boring type system. So um, <laughs> little information in the types. We can do so many things which we don't have to express in the types. So um, we're working on a thing called the granule language, which is Haskell, like it looks a bit like Haskell. It happens to be strict because that's um, en vogue at the moment. Um, but it is linear by default, um, which is you know, very painful. We like that pain of not being able to write many programs. Well, not quite. Like in Haskell, you can write these programs. You just have to make it explicit in the types. And we will see this. And we will learn about these fantastic graded modalities, which I'm sure in about 100 years' time are going to be in Scala, and maybe in 200 years' time in the mainstream. OK. so. Two disclaimers. This is a research language. Um, we do have about 1,500 commits, 10,000 lines of code, and like 200 GitHub stars, which for an academic thing is like, wow. <laughs> but I guess um, uh, you guys here, um, you, weigh your, um, you weigh repos with other uh, units of measure than us uh, lowly academics. And the... Um, <coughs> We are very explicit. So you can think of this perhaps as a sort of core language um, to help us make very explicit what happens in programs. Maybe we can, maybe the, the, the types kind of look nice to me. There are some annoying things sometimes going on at the term level, which perhaps we can uh, infer and get some compiler to do for us. But at the moment, that's not our focus. So that's the disclaimer. What is the aim of this talk? There's not going to be any Greek in this talk. I hope. If I accidentally put in some Greek somewhere, um, call me out on it. Um, if you don't want to see it, throw rotten tomatoes at me. But if you do want to see it, we have an ICFP paper, hopefully, hopefully, because I'm going to find out tonight whether it actually got finally accepted. We got a conditional accept on it, um, so it should be OK. But we'll find out tonight. Um, so yeah everything in that paper, and we will be giving an ICFP tutorial. So if you're coming to ICFP and you, you like this and you want to see more of it, then come to our tutorial. Some motivations for linearity. Oh, and I forgot to say what the motivation of this talk was. I said what it isn't. So what it is is I just want to give you an overview of what Granule does, hope to sort of um, make you hungry for more um, fancy type systems. And also, maybe you guys can give me ideas on um, how to actually make these things more practical. So that would be fantastic as well. So why do we want linearity? We know about the efficiency, things like in-place update. There's usage protocols, file handles. And these are actually, we've got them implemented, and we'll have a look at them in a second. Um, streaming I.O., session type channels, which are also implemented. Um, blah de blah de blah Lots of great reasons to have them. <coughs> Um, I'm currently playing around with um, having safe, an in, a safe interface to uh, pointers or references. Um, there's lots of fun stuff to explore. And um, mutable arrays, and so on. There's also an aspect which I haven't heard um, many people talk about, which is program reasoning. And we'll see a nice example of that as well. So reasoning about pure code. So our... Our lemma, our, our, um, our um, motto, so to speak, is uh, data as a resource. So when you ask us for all x, is x infinitely copyable? Is x arbitrarily discardable? We will say, a la Philip Wadler, no. OK, so this is a quote from, a sort of one word quote from uh, his um, paper, Linear Types Can Change the World. Um, and there's a funny reason if you want to know why he used the um, upside down exclamation mark. You have to go in that paper. That's Philip, H H F. Philip Wadler, linear types can change the world. Um, OK. Hands up if you're OK with that function. No, understand what that means? OK, just to make sure everyone's on board. So it's a function that binds any value of type A. We call it x and it returns that value x. OK, great. Is this a linear function? Show of hands for, for no. OK, one, uh, some two maybes, I think. Yes, it is a linear function. 
Okay? Well, I haven't told you what linear is, so this was a, a trick question. Um, and I'm just going to uh, give you sort of an intuition um, in today's talk, and if you want to know exactly, um, read the paper. Um, but I think it's kind of easy to understand in some sense it, because it corresponds a bit to how we reason about things in the real world. Um, so if you give me an X, I can give you an X, you know? It's easy. Um, so this is what our interpreter says when we pass in this, this exact function. We can you know, just take the syntax exactly, throw it into our interpreter, and it will say, okay. This one here. Is that a linear, a linear um, function? No. Yes. Okay, unsure. Okay, so let's think about uh, what we did in ID, in uh, uh, identity. We, we, um, um, we bound a variable x on the left, and we returned it on the right-hand side. So here on the left, we're binding a variable x, and we're binding a variable y. And then we're returning y on the right-hand side, and we're returning x on the right-hand side. So we're sort of giving back everything that we were given. So that is linear. Okay? So our interpreter says, okay. What about this one? Copy. If you give me anything of type, um, so this for all A actually quantifies over all types. So if you give me anything in the real world, if you give it to me, can I give you back two copies of it? No, right? So um, as you might have guessed, this is not a linear function. And our interpreter will say, linearity error. Linear variable x is used more than once. This here is also not a linear function. Um, we're not affine. We're, you know, especially painful. Linear, you have to use it. Okay, which is, which is great for, 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 for um, um, resource reasoning because we can then enforce things like something must be closed, uh, you must free this memory, et cetera. Okay, so linear variable x is never used. Can we actually implement anything in this? Well, let's, let's play a bit with file handles. Whoops. Okay. Um, okay. Um, not sure what the type is yet. Um, okay. Let's open a file handle. Open file. Um, read mode. I think this is how you spell it. I'm gonna switch to this keyboard here. Um, and now we have to open a file. Gosh, should we be really meta and open ourselves? Um, slash hello, dot gr. Okay, and what we get back from this is a handle. And um, this thing, this, this arrow is a bit, um, you know, like Haskell's bind, uh, do notation, which D sugars into bind. Um, or in Scala, you have something, I think, four comprehensions. I did my research. <laughs> okay. And then let's, let's just uh, say in 42, and let's give main type int. Uh, open file is apparently the wrong, okay, we keep changing things. So let's have a look inside where all the primitives are defined and see what it's actually called. Oh, it's called open handle, now I remember, I don't have to look. Oops. Okay, so all right, so uh, we have a problem here because this is, this is actually monadic, right? So I can't just, I can't just be doing effects there. And, um, and then return a pure value. So... Can, can you increase the same size of the Like that? Okay. 
So actually, this thing is monadic. So let's say IO. OK, but now it's complaining. Linear variable H is never used. Damn it. OK. So let's use it. Um, let's say read file, read handle H. And then we get back a string. But now let's look into the primitives. Um, what is the type of read handle? Uh, no, what was it called? Was it read handle? No. Um, open handle. OK, read char. Let's just read one character. OK, so if we do read char, it gives us so it takes a handle, and it returns a character, but it also returns a new handle, OK? So linearity basically forces us. Uh, whoops, handle. OK, this is, this is kind of really hard to life code like this, looking backwards. Um, <laughs> and most of my uh, talk was going to be life coding, but OK, we'll see how that goes. Um, And that gives us a pause error because I need a semicolon. Ooh, who knew this? Who's granule expert? OK. OK, uh, I think I don't know. I haven't done this one uh, in ages. I, I hadn't planned to do this once, and I think uh, read char? it is read char, <laughs> and I don't want to waste time on this now because I have so much to show. Uh, but yeah, OK. So let, okay, let's fix it quickly. Read char. Never mind that the thing is called stro now. OK, so now it's going to complain again. And then if I um, close handle h, then well, I still haven't used my string. OK, well, I need to do something with my string. Well, I'll just return it for now. Or I could, I could print it and not return anything. But let's just return the string. Uh, it's actually a char, but who cares? Um, Oops. Yes, yes. <laughs> Woo! We did I.O. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to have, I don't know if, I think if I can turn this thing around, maybe it's going to be a bit easier. <laughs> OK, OK, OK. All right. So what about, what about copy? We still can't, we still don't know how to copy. OK, well, let's define a data type for Booleans. Data bool. Um, does that look good? Yep. Um, now we want to define a function that copies these booleans. Um, so we go from bool to bool cross bool. And the cross is just, I mean, it's just it's the type constructor for pairs. So copy bool. False, was false, false. And copy bool true equals true, true. Hey, that works. And this is not nonlinear because linearity is about variables, usage of variables. So, so this thing here is actually OK. So does this mean we have to write lots of annoying monomorphic functions now? No, 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 on the contrary. This is, we don't like these monomorphic functions because I called this copy bool, so maybe you believe it copies, but I might be doing something sneaky like this, right? And this would still type check. Um, so there we go. We, we do want polymorphism. How can we get our polymorphism? Uh, how can we get copy and polymorphism reconciled? Back to the slideshow. OK. Girard, the clicker doesn't work. Um, so in Girard's um, original linear logic, there's a type constructor called bang. I don't know if he called it bang, but everyone calls it bang. Um, because it's an exclamation mark. And everything in that bang can be used nonlinearly. So if we want to do copy, we do a bang of A to pairs of A's. And then 
at the value level, we are given the parameter, the, the, the parameter and copy is no longer just of type A, it's type of, is of type bang A. So there's a special let bang construct um, to sort of unwrap that. Does that make sense, more or less? So think of these things as type constructors um, and just like, say, maybe or something. You need to just unwrap them. OK. Um, no, actually, maybe is, that's a Haskell thing. It's called option scale, isn't it? OK. In granule syntax, this is what we do. So we have these little boxes behind the A. This means this is a, an, a box of A or an A box. Um, and at the value level, you, do, you use the brackets to, to do an unboxing pattern match. OK, so we can do these two in granule. And these things are actually sort of, we use this um, notation because these correspond to, to modalities from modal logic. Um, and we have them postfix, which is very weird, but they can get a bit full because there is actually, these are actually graded modalities. So there's information inside these modalities, and once we write that in there, they can get long. So, you know, actually, we still want to know the, the, sort of the type of the thing is still more interesting than the modality. So we write a postfix. All right. Then bounded linear logic is basically, think of it like linear logic, but it gives you more precise information. It says, um, this function takes an A that is used at most twice. And drop takes an A that is used at most zero times. Yeah? So, you get, so you can now, in the types, distinguish between copy and drop. So the way this would look in granule is like this. All good? Any interjections, any objections? No? OK. All right, so let's do a demo. And please, please ask me uh, questions during the demo and uh, get me to break things. Um, we get lots of fun bugs exposed during talks. It's the best. Um, OK. So let's define a data type for um, optionals. And OK, I'll, does that look right? Yeah, and then what, what do you call it? None, like that? OK, all good. OK, so, what, so in Haskell, we have something called from maybe. What do you call that in Scala? Which takes a default? I'm afraid, yes. Hmm? Get or else. Get or else. Get, OK, I'm going to call it from option. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and for all A, we're given a default value, and we're given an option A, and we want to give back an A, yeah? From option, the default, and then in the none case, we give back the default, and here we need to check some, uh, yeah, okay, so let's say, oh, then your variable x is never used. Oh, I made, I made a mistake, fine. Oh, now linear variable d is never used, huh. all right. So we're actually not using the default value, and I've got 10 minutes, 10 minutes left? <laughs> okay, okay, let's breeze through this, let's breeze through this. Um, I promise we'll finish before lunch. Um, I won't be the pesky person holding you up for lunch. Um, OK, so um, yeah, all right, I'll be quick. So long story short, we're using this A zero to once. Yeah? Look how cool is that? We can be super precise. And now we still have to do our term level unwrapping, which is the thing I said to you is a bit clunky, but necessary. Ta-da! OK, <laughs> so now we're saying, we're using the default value zero to one times. And this, the bug I did when I copy and pasted the line where I had D here, which you know, Haskell would accept, bad Haskell. It would accept this implementation. Um, linear types help us prevent. Because we're always going to be linear in this option. OK? All right, so let's breeze through this. Um, let's 
import vectors, um, have a quick look at, they're all just d normal defined things. I was going to define them myself, actually, but now, um, due to time, let's just use the ones from the standard library. So they're just length indexed. So lists that are length indexed at the type level. Yeah, okay, everyone loves them, in academia at least. Um, okay, so now let's define a function lift pad that, okay, let's do like the Haskell style. It takes a char, which is a padding character. Um, it takes a desired length, and it takes a list of char, which is called, which they call string, and it gives back a string. Okay, a vague idea of what left pad does. It takes a string and pads it to a to a certain length, um, given the padding character on the left. Yeah, all good. Okay, so let's. So, so if you look at this type, this type is actually bad, bad type because it's monomorphic. It's this implementation could, depending on what sort of padding character you're giving it, it could have completely different behavior. Okay, so if you, if you give it a space, it might pad on the left, but then if you pass it a, a, an asterisk, it might pad them on the right because it doesn't like asterisks on the left. Um, so that's, that's very bad. We want to be, um, if we want to uh, reason about code, we want, if we want to get to free theorems, we need to be polymorphic. Okay, that's fine. We can do that in Haskell. We take an A instead of a char. And we go from lists of, that's how we write it in Haskell, I'm sorry. Okay. That's better, and we can also do, we can also um, ensure the length of, 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 um, of the input and output using type indices. We can do that in Haskell. But how do we know that such a function doesn't always just give us back a lot of padding characters, and actually just throws away our original string? Well, with linear types, we can actually guarantee that, even in pure code. So we get nice guarantees. So if we have a function left pad, uh, for all a and mn nat, okay, um, we take a padding character. We take, this is a, this is just an index singleton encoded natural number. Uh, we take a vec, an input string, and we give back an output string, and we're going to say it's going to be the max of m and n. Okay. Will we be able to implement such a function? No. Ooh. Okay, why, why can we not implement this function? Yes, so the A is, we're going to use the A nonlinearly. So we, what we're going to do in here is something like uh, left pad, padding character, M, uh, it's called X, M, X's, is like replicate M minus length of X's, X plus X's. Something like that, yeah? So... Um, uh, what's your name? Guillaume. 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 As, oh, same as my name. Willem Guillaume. It's, anyway, in French. Um, so, uh, as Guillaume pointed out, we're going to have to use the X here non-linearly. So, what is replicate? How is replicate implemented? Let's have a look at replicate. Okay. We take a number, and we take an A that has to be available that many times. Okay, so we, he's right. We, we really can't implement this like that. Okay, but if we propagate the constraint that we need that, um, that, we need that A um, non-linearly, then, then we're going to be fine. But what are we going to put in there? How many times are we going to be using the A? Zero to M. M. Mm. My notes say otherwise. My notes say this. M minus N, right? So M is the desired length. N is the actual length. So if the desired length um, 
is bigger than the, than the actual length, then we get that, then we're going to subtract the actual length and we get we left over with the with the number of padding elements we need okay and because this is monus we just cut off at zero uh, monus so we just we end up at zero yeah uh, oh cut off subtraction some people call it okay we're still doing something bad here, actually, which is a bit annoying because it's actually not bad. We are using, we're using uh, the list nonlinearly. Oh no, how are we going to get around this? Well, oh, we need something to do time level unwrapping. Well, we can say um, we can get the length of the list. Uh, let n x's equal length. Of x, x's in. Ah, yeah. Um, oh, look at that. We have to write a length function that actually gives you the list back. Hmm. Oh. So in the nil case, we return zero, and in the cons case, we. Um, we recurse on the inner list, and then we build it back up here. Yeah, this is sort of our constructive proof that this is really, that length is, is, is sort of linear, that we can still have the list after taking its length. Um, and we can't write this, we write it like this. Um, okay, this should work. Um, length prime. Oh, right. I did last minute fiddling around with things, which is always recommended. Could not resolve operator minus. Mm. Oh, right. Sure. Um, this is actually the term level thing is called monus, and it's also defined in the Nats library. Um, ta -da -da yeah, I don't know, whatever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, it works, it works, and I don't have time to fix it now. Um, those are the perils of live coding, but we can sit down together and, and break it more if you want after the talk. Um, so let's go back to our slides. I was gonna talk about these lovely semi-rings uh, which Martin already told us about. Um, I'm not sure we're gonna have much time. Three minutes. Okay, quick overview of granules type system. Um, we have index types, linearity, and graded modalities, blah, 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 marketing. Um, we use an SMT solver, we use Z3, which hopefully discharges our constraints, but these things are sort of over things like natural number polynomials. They're not, um, they're not decidable, um, but they seem to work really well for, for the things we've been considering so far. Um, and you don't have to do the clunky sort of manual uh, things like an Agda or Idris, um, which people hate. I love them, but... Okay, very, very quickly, we use... You use these semi-ring operations um, like, bound, like from bounded linear logic, um, which just uses normal natural number plus and multiplication. But actually, we're parametric over the semi-ring. So we can actually say, well, this zero and this plus, they don't need to be natural numbers, zero and plus. We might, be, we might want to do other um, analyses that give different meanings to these things. So, so there's things like Boolean, there's the uh, Boolean semi-ring, which can give us, inf we can use to track information like, well, for example, is it linear or is it not linear? Or is it pure or is it not pure? Is it total or is it partial? That kind of thing. Um, the extended naturals allow us to, to reason about things where you add sort of infinity to the natural numbers and um, where you reach sort of a top, uh, which is the top element which you reach when you don't, really don't know if you have no upper bound on the usage. Um, and so on. I've managed to bring a bit of, of, of Scala syntax into this slide. Um, 
So we have interval, which you saw very quickly on option we have to use, um, we had to use the default zero to one times, so that's an interval. We can take any semi-ring, any pre-ordered semi-ring, and, and, an, and lift it to an interval, which is then also a semi-ring. So it's like a higher order, blah, blah, blah. Um, monoids um, are kind of, you can also plug in monoids, where you uh, use the zero and the one are both the same element, and the plus and times are both the same element. Uh, the same operation, the same, um, yeah, same operation. So things like sets of labels um, to track effects and perhaps implicits. This is something I'd be interested about, whether we can sort of um, embed implicits in our framework and reason about them in that way. And I think one, just one um, uh, word I wanted to drop here is um, algebraic effect handlers. So there's a, there's a very strong uh, correspondence and um, uh, intimate relationship with al algebraic effect handlers, but yet to be explored fully. Future work. Okay, so very quickly, Edwin was so nice to visit our us to visit our department um, a few months ago, and he showed us Idris 2 in action, and he has found that the proof search, which happens to be term inference, yeah, so th it is exciting also to industrial uh, developers, um, gets much better with linear types. When you constrain the search space by saying, well, I know that you should be using, you know, you should be using this linearly, or you should be using this at most twice, then we cut out a lot of bad programs, and that helps with inference. And maybe, yes, we add a bit of, we add a bit of extra things to the types, so in the case of left pads, all we had to add to the sort of type like the mildly interesting type in Haskell where you actually keep track of the correct lengths, um, all we had to add was that one little m minus n, right? But that cut out a lot of bad implementations. In fact, all of the bad implementations except the ones that don't put the padding character in the right place. So it gives us a sort of verification or lightweight verification on certain resource-like properties. Um, now, I think this is, this, I think this is all sort of way too lax. I, I, I want to go much further. I want to be more, I want to be more constraining. Um, we still have exchange, which is another structural, um, structural rule in type systems, which lets us use um, term-level variables in any order. That's bad, right? We don't want to use stuff in any order. That's just messy. I mean, here we're in Switzerland. I, you're all going to agree with me, right? There has to be order. Um, so... Let's say, and, and, and I was thinking, uh, sitting at the train station uh, doing some of these slides yesterday, and thinking, well, what am I going to call this modality? What am I going uh, to, that lets you commute things. So maybe some of, the, some of you get the reference there, very geeky. Um, okay. So this is our normal map function. And see, we'd have to explain that the f commutes, because the f is used um, both here in the, both here. And here, so it's used both nonlinearly and obviously whenever you use something nonlinear, well, yeah, it's, it's not used in an orderly fashion, let's say, like that. So what if someone gave you, wrote, you know, gave you this signature and you don't know this yet because that was a slide build, um, yeah, that, that came in the wrong order. Um, and there's something missing there. So what if someone gave you a map function that actually switched all the elements around? That would still be okay with a normal linear type. But now, if we say list of A goes to list of B must also be ordered, then we know that this function can't just be switching around things. And my, the my theory is that maybe we don't need to be switching around stuff behind people's backs so much. Maybe making this explicit could also be interesting for at least proving properties, maybe in library functions. I'm sure you wouldn't want to have to do this kind of stuff in the code you write all the time. Um, but it's kind of a nice way. It gives us lots of new th free theorems. This hasn't really been formalized, so this is something I want to um, look into. And that's it. I was going to show you way more code still, but I think we've run out of time. So if you want to see any of the pointers, um, ideas I've been playing around with, um, there's, so there's lots of papers in that area where, which are like 30 pages long. And we're able to express them because we don't have to, in granule, we don't have to explain all the things around how linearity works. We've got a framework for, for, for like a laboratory um, for playing around with linearity. 
So we can explain these ideas in a few lines of code, um, which is really cool. OK, thanks a lot. We really ran out of time there. So we have a minus two minutes left, which I think violates some kind of linearity constraint. <laughs> but the good thing is uh, we have a lunch break coming up. Um, if you would be so kind and follow our volunteers, so you can go outside and just follow the volunteers, uh, or follow someone who is from EPFL, because they know where Le Pontier is. Uh, otherwise, the volunteers also know. And I will be the last. We will meet here back at 1.45. 1.45, next talk. <laughs>